Chinese medicine and uh, put my mattress on top of my car and drove out to San Diego to go to the campus here. Um, during the first year, I was really focused on acupuncture. I did not like herbs. In fact, I strongly disliked herbs. It's not really what I thought I had signed up for. And um, I actually tried to transfer out at the end of my first year before the first year uh, comprehensive exam. And then, I, long story short, ended up staying, t took herbs four, and then everything changed for me once I started doing formulas. And from that point out, I knew that Chinese herbs are really what I wanted my focus to be. Um, so I was lucky enough to study under uh, you know, Zev, Bob Demone, other practitioners here. Uh, Barry Sheen came on, on board at that time, which was a lot of value to me. And so going into private practice, I knew that doing Chinese herbs was something that I wanted to make a, a priority. Um, since then, I would say that about 80% of my patients uh, take Chinese herbs. I uh, see about 50 to 60 people a month. And so we, we turn over a lot of herbs there at the pharmacy. And uh, it's been very successful for me. And I know that uh, part of the problem in California right now, especially with the board exam, is that Chinese herbs aren't the priority. Uh, if I recall, it's somewhere around 10, 15 percent of the questions cover Chinese herbs at this point, uh, which is really too bad because when you do get into private practice, you're going to find that uh, the, the greater majority of the cases that you see uh, Chinese herbs should be the, the first thing that we think of. Um, there are certain cases that acupuncture is the primary treatment for, certain cases that Chinese herbs are the primary treatment for. And so even though it's not a focus necessarily with the, uh, the board exam, it should definitely be a focus for you once you get into private practice. Um, so the, uh, I was lucky enough to carry my own herbal pharmacy in the beginning, which definitely does make it a little bit easier. However, there's quite a few uh, pre prescription service uh, companies out there now uh, where you're able to do custom formulas and order your own formulas. Uh, so there's a lot of diversity you know, available to you as a, as a new practitioner. So, um, so basically, if you, if you have any specific questions, you know, for me, feel free to ask. And then, uh, if anyone has questions for me, you know, as well, um, is this a Sean Hanlun class or herbs? Uh, uh, Chinese herbal medicine. Internal medicine. Okay. So, how far is everyone into the program right now? This is it. This is the... You're going to be graduating soon. Okay. All right. So, yeah, you definitely have a lot of uh, choices to make here. You know. Uh, what type of practice are you planning on having? Are you going to join a group? Are you going to go into private practice? Uh, I heard people talking about a cruise ship. That was something that became popular uh, right when I was graduating. I've, uh, one of my first roommates actually went on and still does practice on the cruise ship, and it works for him. Uh, but it, it's, it's something that you should definitely start thinking about now. And uh, you know, really my best advice is to figure out what is going to be most valuable to you, what, what's going to be the most fulfilling option for you as a practitioner, uh, and then to focus on making it happen from there. I knew I wanted to do private practice. I knew I wanted to work for myself uh, you know, and grow that, so that was always my priority. Yeah, Doing uh, herbs has a lot of these facets that you talked about that you don't necessarily get introduced to while you're here at the school. And so a lot of this where I sought people out that I'm like, have you done herbs? What did you do? You know, basically talking to anyone I could. And a lot of it I just found out uh, along the way. Some of the experience I had as an intern, you know, because as soon as I, Herbs 4 came around and I was like, oh, Bai Xiao Dong Wei, Dui Yao, you know, going off to that, I was trying to prescribe herbs to anyone I could, my pets, my parents, my friends, you know. And so you kind of uh, get some, some experience with some of those things that you mentioned along there. But um, so the issue with cleanliness and quality control of the herbs obviously is a big concern, you know, right now. And so that's why you definitely want to source your herbs from a company that has a good reputation uh, and that follows certain GMP manufacturing protocols. Okay. So the granules that I use, for example, are produced to an international GMP standard, uh, which is the highest global standard. And so the, the, the country of China makes its Chinese herbal uh, medicine a priority in general because it's more of a matter of pride for them. Okay, so there's that. But then second, they're not the only entity responsible for monitoring uh, these herbs, both to make sure that they are the correct species because there's a lot of adulterants in Chinese medicine, uh, but that they actually contain the active compounds you're looking for and nothing in addition to that. And so the Chinese government is responsible for that in one part. The international good manufacturing 
processes board is responsible for monitoring that. And then the herbs, unlike pharmaceuticals coming into this country, are screened again once they arrive into this country also. Not. Generally not. And so they go through a very strict regulating uh, process to make sure that they're clean. And that's why I use the granules that I use. The other reason I, I ended up uh, not doing Chinese herbs, cause, or excuse me, raw herbs, when I was here at the pharmacy, uh, at the clinic, I did a lot of raw herbs just because it was easy, they maintained it, I didn't have to worry about the overhead or if things went bad because they do go bad very often. Even if you go with a company like Mayway and you get a good quality product, uh, if you get Lingjer, it's usually only a matter of time before weird little bugs start coming out. Mm -hmm. And it looks like Swiss cheese. And with granules, you don't have that problem. And I like granules because they're consistent. I always know that with each gram, I'm getting five grams of raw herb. I know that it's been tested for authenticity, you know, that it has a consistent medical grade uh, uh, level to it. So I can rely on that when I prescribe it. And uh, I don't have to worry about weird bugs coming out or, or the space that it takes to do raw herbs or some of the other issues that come in uh, with it there. So do you do patents? Or and, yeah, so then your other question there is a lot of that, what you're going to carry in your pharmacy is going to depend on what, what type of practitioner you are, what kind of cases you're seeing. So uh, I only do granules. I have a couple of raw herbs on hand, very specific, like I keep ginseng on hand if I want to go ahead and like make tinctures sort of thing. Uh, and then I keep a few herbal patches, like 701 plaster. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I suggest you become familiar with it because it's a very effective plaster. You just put on and it's great for pain. You saw it all over the, the Olympics uh, this last year. And that's about it. But my business partner, who's an orthopedic pain specialist, he has pre-made formula tinctures that he'll occasionally give, but he mostly sees pain, you know. So he has pain formulas, he has a few tea pills, uh, and then he has a bunch of different plasters and, and topical liniments addressed for acute pain, chronic pain, you know, diff different types of injuries. And I really don't see that sort of thing. Uh, so I don't need to carry those types of products. Now, um, I, I got out of tea pills just because tea pills tend to be one of these items that are useful to you if um, you're dealing with patients who have a low compliance or you don't want to spend a lot of time getting patients to take herbs or, you know, and, and, but they tend to have a pretty low potency and so I, you know, I, I, I didn't go that route. But if you really are confident as an herbalist and you're confident engaging your patients, describing why you're, you're using Chinese herbs and even saying, you know, listen, for your, for your condition here, Chinese herbs are our are, are primary treatment. And so um, I'm not afraid to say, you know, tell people that this, they, they need to take herbs, you know, and you need to know how to have that dialogue basically, you know, in a comfortable way. And uh, when people talk about an issue with compliance with patients and herbs, it's usually a matter of delivery and confidence as a practitioner, because if you know that this case requires herbs, you know what the formula is, you know what your, your strategy is going to be, then there generally isn't a problem getting people to take it, to take, yeah, to take their formula. So a lot of that, um, you know, what type of, of, of herbal product you're going to use, a lot of that has to do with, with who you are as a practitioner and really what type of patients you're going to be seeing on a regular basis. You said you didn't use tinctures, why? Um, you know, it, Tinctures tend to, there's so many different styles in Chinese medicine in general. And especially with Chinese herbs, because you can do raw, you can do granule, you can do tincture, you can do tea pills, you can make your own patches, liniments. Liquid extracts are not tinctures. Uh, or liquid, exactly, you know. No. Yeah. They're 50 50 water alcohol <coughs> at the temperature. Which tinctures one? are pressing herbs into an alcoholic substrate. Yeah. So, process known as maceration, different processes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it, it tends to be really a matter of style and what your facility can accommodate. Um, making my own just never really held an appeal to me, you know. And so uh, whereas it does hold an appeal to other people, but they have different requirements. You know, if you're giving liquid herbs, basically, you can get them single and you can mix them yourselves. You know, there's a pharmacy here, uh, private practice, uh, fertility practice, that, you know, they have their own single 
herbs in, in, in a liquid base, and they can mix it that way. But then you need bottles and droppers, you know, uh, things. So there's just different requirements and becomes a style issue. And there really is no right or wrong way. Uh, it's more of what, is, what fits your style and what you feel an, an attunement toward, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, anybody else want to jump in here? All right, I'll keep going. <laughs> After you ask me, what kind of patients do you treat? So I have a, a, a general practice, so I see all sorts of, of different cases. And in the beginning, I was taking anything basically that I could find. Uh, but at this point, I really stick mostly with, with internal issues. You know, uh, just today I got a call from a new patient with sciatic pain, and I directed them toward Kirk because he's more of the pain guy. Uh, but I do a lot of fertility cases are, are the majority that I see at this point. And fertility is definitely one of those things to where, yes, there's acupuncture protocols, but it is definitely you know, dominated by Chinese herbal medicine uh, for that particular you know, case. And so um, that just developed. I always wanted to make uh, women's health and fertility a priority when I was in school. Uh, but then getting out of it, it's something to where I saw uh, our medicine working very well and got good results and so you know you develop your style and, and again what type of uh, patients you want to see as you as you just kind of jump into it and get started yeah I mean I, I don't know if anyone else would find this helpful but can you list what companies you use just as a base of operation sure you know it sounds like a lot of your research was done by word of mouth so um, for the granules that I use yeah like where, where do you get your stuff like where would you start all right, so that's really going to depend on um, what type of practice you're going to be having and uh, what your facility can accommodate. Okay, so for granules, the ones that I prefer to work with are from Legendary Herbs. I think you guys know Eric Brand. This is his company. Very high quality. Very high quality. Legendary Herbs are the name that they take on once they arrive into the United States and Eric sells them. They're from Tianjiang Pharmaceutical. Tianjiang invented the process of making granules. Uh, they are the source of, of granules for the Chinese government for like the SARS epidemic, the swine flu, bird flu, one of those animal flus. And they're used in about 400 hospitals worldwide. You can actually dissolve them and, and take them as an IV, which they do, and like Sheng Mai San for regulating the heart. Very effective. And here's the thing about granules is that there's chunky granules like legendary herbs. You guys can just go to the pharmacy here and play and you know pour out the different different types of herbs. Uh, and then there's fine powdery herbs like Mayway or Evergreen. And I don't like working with the fine powdery herbs. They uh, don't mix very well. They get dust everywhere. They're a pain uh, for me to work with. And um, with legendary herbs, they're a bulky grain and the dust content is much lower, okay? So I'm actually filling my formulas. Instead of breathing in half of my herbs, uh, only a little bit of dust comes out and I have a little HEPA filter that sits right there next to the scale, you know? So you turn it on and you're pouring your herbs out, it gets sucked into the thing because if you have an office like I do and you're working with granule herbs and you're getting dust, that dust is gonna go somewhere, either across your carpets and you're gonna be sticky feet or on your walls or, you know, et cetera. See, the sort of practical problems you're never going to know about until you actually start doing it. And that was one of the first things. I'm like, geez, I got a layer of grime all over it, you know, so having a little filter there. But the, the, grain, the, the chunky granules also are very easy to weigh out, put into a little container, swirl around, mix it up real well, and then put it into a bottle, you know. Um, so that's where I get those. And they also have a lot of different um, powder. So processed herbs, so like Baiju or Baiju Chao or Swan Zhao Ren is actually Swan Zhao Ren Chao, which is the, you know, the form that we typically prescribe Swan Zhao Ren for anyway. And a lot of these different processed uh, herb varieties that are generally only available with raw herbs, which was, is one of the advantages of raw herbs, is that you can get a lot of these different, uh, you know, because like Donggui Ju, wine fried Donggui, is a lot better for regulating menstruation than regular Donggui is. You know, but these are the only guys where you can actually get that in a granule form. Uh, prices are also very reasonable, you know. But the main thing is, is that they have, to me, in my research, the highest uh, 
uh, authority behind them, you know, where they're coming from. They produce international GMP, so they're clean. Uh, they're also consistent five to one, almost all of them. Uh, there are the granule companies too, where some are five to one, one to one, three to one, eight to one, and that makes writing a, a granule formula more tricky. Okay. Um, now, other supplies, I mean, if you're doing raw herbs, generally you're going to want to go with someone like Mayway. And even if you're not doing a full on raw pharmacy, you might want to stock certain raw herbs that you can use in food therapy. Donggui and Huangqi and Renchen and, and Sesame and quite a few, Shanyao, I could there, name quite a few. And um, there's all sorts of ways that you can do that. You can even buy them like fooling powder and make it like a bread crust or bread crust or a, like a, a breading for like fish or something like that. You know, so this is so lots of different ways. I come from a background, you know, Zev does too, in like traditional Arabic medicine, Middle, you know, Mideastern medicine, where they use a lot of food therapy. That's the, their, their primary uh, uh, medicine. And so I was really drawn toward that idea of using Chinese herbs as food therapy too. Um, now, let's say you need bottles for your granule herbs, you know, like the white bottles they have at the pharmacy, where are you going to get those? You know, so you've got to start that process too, you know. And so, um, what are they even called? All these things I had to like figure out when I graduated. I'm like, what are those bottles? Plastic white bottles? That's what. I, they're called HDPE bottles, and you can get them from like container packaging and supply. Um, and, and that's just one company. They get theirs from a, a company called Silver Lights, and they're just up the road, you know, wholesale. Container packaging and supply, but the name of the bottle is HDPE. And the ones that PCOM has here, that size that you're hopefully familiar with, is 225cc. Which, if you're getting nine grams of granules a day, which with legendary herbs is going to be your standard dosage. Uh, typically I start patients with like two weeks worth of formula, you know, that's going to fit into one of these bottles nicely, you know, basically, but then you have to get spoons. So where do you get your spoons? Well, you can get them from legendary herbs if you order from there. If you don't, I, I, haven't, I haven't been able to find them elsewhere. I don't know where they even get theirs. Um, you need lids. Do you want regular lids? Do you want childproof safety lids? You can also get them from here. Um, maybe you don't want to give your herbs in bottles all the time. Maybe you want like little Ziplocs. Well, you need to make sure they're food grade and you can get them from a supply company that you're going to want to use for uh, various items in your office, which is Uline. Some of you might know these guys. If not, you should check them out because you can get all sorts of things that you need for your office there. Um, so, for raw herbs, you're going to need those glass jars that you get out there. That's something, I mean, you could go to uh, the container store or you could find them online, you know. But uh, just to give you an idea of these little sort of int intricacies that you might not know you have to think about until you actually come time to, you know, practice and, and have herbs, you know, sort of thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, another question. What do you do, because they brought this up in our notorious practice management class, when you mix herbs, so if the product comes from legendary herbs, let's say, and you get it, and it's in your sealed bottle, it's GMP compliant. If you crack that bottle open, and you mix it with anything else, then technically it's no longer GMP compliant unless your office is. Do you get involved in any of that? Um, this, is, this is a, a, a really still even a gray area in legislation right now, the GMP. Um, because technically, no, it's no longer GMP. However, it's covered under the scope of our practice to be able to mix herbs and prescribe them. All right. Now, if you wanted to, let's say, I have, I have a, a single herb pharmacy, 325 or so single herbs. If I wanted to mix those and like start my own line of herbs sort of thing, I, I'm going to run into trouble because my facility is not GMP certified. But I don't do that. I sell to physicians, you know, the practitioners, and to my patients. So it's covered under that scope there. Um, but if I were reselling these, then I would need to have a tracking system that showed what ingredients went into that formula, who they came from, 
And then also, it's just like if I were having an organic product on the market, same thing. Then you have to have identification number on the product that can be traced back to the point of origin, basically. So uh, unless you plan on going into the retail business with, with herbs, selling to the public, that's really not something that you're going to have to worry about. Now, it does bring up a thing, though, hygiene in your office. I mean, if you're going to be having any type of herbs or herbal product, obviously, in general, you want your office to be very clean, you know. But uh, if you're doing granules, like I mentioned before, you're going to need a you're going to need a filter sort of thing. You're going to need a sink nearby. You're going to need containers to mix things in. These, these little items, which sounds might sound simple now, but actually becomes a little tricky in, in finding out just the right type of product to use at that time. Honestly, I think, and this is my own preference, the reason I also went to granules too, is that I'm making herbs for almost all my patients. I got X amount of time to get people in and out. I allow 75 minutes to greet someone, go through an intake, treat them, not pick them up off the table and shove them out the door, you know, but to like make herbs there. And it takes a while. It takes a good, good chunk of time. And uh, Kirk doesn't do that. He's 30 minutes with a patient. And so differences again in style. So he's giving, you know, pre-made formulas and tea pills and things where I actually have to sit down. Uh, hopefully I'm not seeing another patient, you know, two patients at a time so I can write a formula and actually fill it. I found that granules took me the least amount of time to write the formula, figure out what had to go in it, mix it, get it prepared and, and presentable for the patient. And so um, I'm able to actually keep and fill my herbs with the patient there because of the time involved. If I had to go to a raw farm, obviously that would take longer uh, to be able to do. You know, so that sort of practical time requirement is, is huge. That it, that and the ease of being able just to mix the things together, even compared to like raw herbs, that's why I went with granule, you know. And to be able just to give them to a patient and they make it like instant coffee and they drink it. Uh, I had, I was lucky to have patients follow me as a, from, an in, from being an intern here into private practice. They were taking raw herbs before I went into private practice and then they started switching to granule and everyone was a lot happier. Um, so in the five years I've been doing this, I've had one request for raw herbs, and that was from a vet who was trained in Chinese medicine, and he just preferred taking raw herbs. That's it. So um, patient compliance is another, big, is another big factor. Most people aren't really going to want to go through the process of cooking the herbs, storing them, taking them. Even as a student making raw herbs, I would burn my herbs half the time. You know forget about them on the stove, usually. Let them cook at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, go ahead, no. <laughs> uh, what's your opinion about um, the other company, and maybe this was just a style issue, um, but what made you choose to do your own pharmacy as opposed to like, um, KPC or cranes, like or like going through their, their prescription service. Their prescription service. Yeah, sure. Um, so that was a combination of factors. One, um, I wanted to have an herbal pharmacy. Okay. okay. So I just did. I, I felt compelled to do that. Um, but uh, to, you know, to really answer your question, it was I was in the right place at the right time. And uh, Eric was here regularly at the school. I was talking to him. And he was looking for someone to do a prescription service with his herbs here in San Diego. I had, uh, so I took the place of the individual who was doing that before I came along and who I was getting my granules from because like I said, I, as soon as I could start writing formulas, I was actually writing formulas and taking them and, and seeing. So um, I had been familiar with a different type of granule products from working in the pharmacy, and um, I didn't like the thin I didn't like the thin powdery formulas, and I, I I just did a very basic comparison as I put down evergreen, I put down mewe, I put down legendary herbs, dissolved them, looked at the color just like kind of like a wine, right, and tasted them, and the one that was very clearly the higher quality was legendary herbs. And, that, and so I was using them for a year before uh, Eric asked me to, you know, to, to, to serve that role. And so I was fortunate to be able to, to have that at the same time you know, of wanting, just getting ready to go into private practice. Okay. 
So um, if I had not had that opportunity, I would have had to have picked which herbs I was going to stock originally. And you know, the herbs I sell the most of at the office, uh, of course, it's going to be like Fu Ling, cheese. Can barely keep it in stock. It's selling all the time. Bai Ju, I think you're going to know like the rest of them, right? Ren Shen, Shan Yao, these ones that tonics, because the majority of herbs you're going to be giving are going to be supplementing like spleen and kidney, and regulating liver and dealing with coughs and you know these sorts of things. You, see, you can see a lot of that. It's definitely going to be the majority you know, that you're doing, um, unless you have a sort of very unique specialty, basically. Uh, and so you start with what you know you're going to ha you're, you're, what you're what you're going to be treating on a regular basis, and then you expand your pharmacy from there. You know, it's really how it works. And um, there are so many different prescription services, like from Crane. Evergreen has someone. Evergreen doesn't actually f do the prescription service. They have someone like me um, who does the prescription f service for them. Uh, there's others too. Um, th I think there's another one here in San Diego who does granule uh, pharmacy. So there, there's a lot of options. And uh, when it comes down to it, what you have to do is, is decide, am I going to be seeing enough patients on a basis in order to stock these things? In the beginning, it's going to be guesswork. You're going to lose some money, probably, you know, because you have to figure things out along the way. Um, but if you start with a prescription service, uh, you're at least going to not lose money, and you might even be able to make money. And most of my practitioners sell their herbs for 30 to 35 cents a gram. You know, so if you can make five, ten dollars a formula, every dollar counts in the beginning. Trust me. You know, a hundred dollars at the end of the month, or two hundred, or three hundred, means I was just able to at least pay my rent. You know, so, and so that can be a real big difference. Uh, the problem is patients, they have to wait to get them. So it can be two, three days before you get the, the, the item in the mail. And they, prescription services are, tend to be pricey. They gotta make money. I sell my, my herbs for 20 cents a gram. Um, keeping it as low as possible so other practitioners can, can make a profit off their formula. Um, so my best advice is unless you are set on being an herbalist, you know, if you have an affinity toward that, um, I would probably start with a prescription service. Figure out who you are as a practitioner first. Get some clientele going and then start to consider what single herbs. Because if you find yourself prescribing, a, you're going to go from all these different treatment options to like, okay, and I'm going to narrow it in here. And I know Zev has his own style with the type of formulas that he prescribes. I can always tell when someone who studied with Zev orders. You know, I see a lot of Sean Hun Loon formulas <laughs> because that's his style. And that's what's been most effective. I have my own style too, also very similar. I do a lot of spleen stomach formulas. And so once you get to that point to where you know uh, <coughs> this much more narrow field of what you're going to be working with, you can just even go with there. Even with acupuncture now, I mean, I pretty much only use the extraordinary channels in regular acupuncture because that's what ended up being my style and what worked for me. And with, with you guys, it's going to be the exact same way, you know, especially with the herbs because there, there's, a, I would dare say, a higher degree of intricacy and artistic um, nuances that go into prescribing Chinese herbs and with acupuncture. Mm -hmm. Anybody? First, uh, no, I like all the questions. I was just curious. Is this the same type of thing you're going to be lecturing on anyway? Is this uh, what, your, what your lecture was about? Today? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, you know, Zev and I were talking and just come in and talk to people about, uh, about herbs, you know, and that was always the problem. For me too, when I was here, is that I was with a lot of acupuncturists, but not a lot of not a lot of herbalists. And as Zev would tell you, and even has been practic the practical case in my own practice, Chinese medicine is about 80% Chinese herbal medicine and about 20% acupuncture, which is the exact opposite of what we get here at the school. And through no no fault of their own, because it's exactly what the board exam is going to expect from you. The board exam is going to be largely determining your ability to fulfill the role of a primary care physician. Lots of Western medicine questions. 
with a little bit of acupuncture and a tiny bit of Chinese herbal medicine. But uh, when getting, getting into private practice, I can tell you that I would be extremely limited in what I could treat if I was only doing acupuncture. Uh, um, I would say easily eight out of 10 times Chinese herbs are the primary form of treatment and that I'm supplementing with acupuncture. There are certain differences like stress. People comes in, oh, I'm stressed out. I might give them herbs if there's some, a major issue that you know, would be benefited by that. But that's where my regular acupuncture comes into play, my understanding of how acupuncture works. You know. uh, but uh, someone comes in with a cough, herbs. Works every single time. If you get the pattern right, works like a charm very quickly, you know, that sort of thing. So, um, so in coming in here for the lecture was basically to ad address that point and then to see if you guys had any questions, you know, getting ready to go into uh, private practice here soon. So hopefully that answers your question. No, yeah, I would, that's okay. what I was trying to yeah. say. I really love the questions, but I just want to make sure maybe we have limited time. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> and you keep an eye on time for me, too. Okay. Well, I just have one more mm -hmm. question. Yeah. Startup capital? <clears throat> it was about $1,500 for me to um, get my granules in the beginning. That was a lot of granules that I got, though. Um, mixing bins. You got to get a scale. You have to get storage items that are sealed. You have to get cleaning equipment. These sorts of items, yeah. Um, I know that Greg Sperber used to say you want about ten thousand dollars to start up your own private practice. I would say it's around twelve thousand to start up your own private practice. Um, uh, sounds like a lot, uh, and it is. That's one of the disadvantages. I um, had a very strong conviction and just took a leap of faith, and I put it all on a credit card. I wouldn't recommend that to anyone. I'd be prepared to fail <laughs> and ex to accept that possibility. Um, but that was my conviction, and so I worked my butt off and was able to pay it back. Um, second year, I was in practice. You know, um, thanks to insurance. You guys definitely want. I know that's a little off topic, but you definitely want to accept insurance if you're going into private practice. Yeah, I know some people say otherwise, but. That's a mistake. But insurance doesn't yeah, I know. Yeah, the thing with with uh, insurance is um, some don't pay very well. I have a third party that does my billing for me, so I don't have to get involved with that. But there are certain insurance plans that pay very well. But then none of them cover herbs. Really. None of them cover herbs. No. And so if you want to be a successful herbalist, you have to start practicing talking to people about herbs. You have to be supremely confident in your herbal ability. You know, even though it's not going to be a lot on the board exam, you get so much ex exposure here to the tools that you're going to need. I was talking to a student just the other day about this. Is, you know, she was like, there's, out of all the different things, there seems like six different treatment strategies I could take with, with herbs. And she's right. I mean, there definitely is. And that's, that's why you want to know the Sean Hunloon. You want to know the classics. You want to, know, you want to talk to someone like Barry Sheen about what they're doing over in the hospitals right now. You know? uh, you, and you want to get exposed to uh, someone like uh, uh, Dr. Cordino, who's a pain specialist. You want to get exposed to um, uh, you know, the different practitioners there, even who have training from different lineages. Uh, because when you get your cases in, there's going to be multiple different uh, strategies that you can take, different schools, medicine, different, different formulas that you, can, that you can choose. So that's why you need to uh, have that repertoire to start with, because some are going to work, some aren't. And that's why you start with all this different uh, you know, background, and then it gets narrowed in as you start to really feel for what gives you the, the clinical results you know, based on, on your style. And uh, PCOM definitely gets, gives you that exposure. I was even looking in the student lounge. There's uh, uh, two different herbal seminars coming up here uh, this month. Three. Three, yeah. So you want to get exposed to those. Even just the other week, I had a weird eye case that tweaked my memory of something being, uh, being here in class. And I got my old full you know, notebook open and was referencing all these different st treatment strategies for grainy st stony bits in the eyes. You know. 
And uh, so that was never emphasized again, but it ended up giving me a treatment result that made the patient thrilled, and now I have a regular patient as, as a result, you know, so. Um, sorry, do you, do you ever find that your acupuncture practice, the money that comes from like the insurance clients and things that you get, does that supplement your herbal practice, or is your herbal practice profitable of standalone? So, uh, are you talking about prescription service, or my, the, the herbs part of my, my practice? I guess both. Uh, the answer is profitable for both. Um, I don't make a lot of money from the prescription service. I'd have to raise my prices in order to do that. Um, but it keeps my inventory, inventory turning. It gets me a, all sorts of exposure to different people's practice styles. Uh, but my, my herbs in my own private practice definitely pay for themselves. There's no doubt. And I mean, honestly, if you're giving a, a granule formula for anything but like an acute case or an extreme case where you want to give more than like 9, 12 grams of granule a day, they're looking at paying $50, $60 a month for their herbs. That's less than one acupuncture treatment with me, you know. So um, there's plenty of patients who just come in for herbal consults and just take herbs. So. Uh, I would say a good third of my clientele just just take herbs, and I'm more than happy, more than happy to do it. You know, I'll make five ten dollars off the formula. They'll pay for their office visit, and still get herbs at a real good price. How much do you charge for an office visit? For an herbal consult. Both, yeah. Perfect. So if someone comes and sees me for an herbal consult, they're going to be there for uh, forty five to sixty minutes, and it's forty. $45 for a return visit, $75 for the first. Um, for acupuncture, uh, point of service price is what we should all call it, uh, is $95 for the first visit and $65 for follow-up visits, which is pretty standard for, uh, for this area, if a little on the low side. Any question back there? Uh, Asking what to charge? Well, I was just wondering you guys want to be going ready for herbal consult only. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen a lot of acupuncture, acupuncture and herbs, but I just wanted to do herbs. Yeah, and if you have people coming in uh, just for herbal consults, you know, especially referrals, and you're doing a good job because lots of people hear about acupuncture and are going to come to you for acupuncture because you know, Chinese herbal medicine doesn't get a whole lot of press coverage. It's not nearly the you know the picturesque, cool thing that acupuncture is, you know, mainstream wise. But it's definitely, honestly, it's going to be the, the most important uh, uh, treatment modality for you in your office, by far, by, by far. And so you're going to get this thing where people come in for this complaint, and then you know, you're, you're, the, the, you're the lord of, of your treatment space, and you ex explain to them that this, this is what it's going to be, <laughs> basically. You lay it out there. And if, you, and if you're authoritative, but calm and non-arrogant about it, I mean, you don't want to be, then they're going to, almost always, they're going to be fine with it. I hardly ever have someone tell me, oh, I'm going to wait on the herbs. Not anymore, you know. Maybe in the beginning when I was a little bit more, I was new, you know. I had lots of theory, no practical experience. Yeah. Um, where I go to now is Zev, to be honest. You know, I go see him both to be treated uh, because if you really want to understand the medicine, why am I so confident that acupuncture works? Because I can move my arm again, you know. Why do I know herbs work so well? Because they fixed my health in two very dramatic ways, you know. And so you, if, if you want to be an herbalist, you have to take herbs, you know. And uh, there gets to be a point, though, to where there are so many different paths that you could take. Do I want to be a traditionalist? Do I, do I want to practice like Zev or do I want to practice like Barry Sheen? Completely different. Completely different. Barry Sheen knows the classics, but he's practicing like they do in, in the hospitals there to where they have standard clinical formulas. You got diabetes, you get da 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 You know. Uh, so that you get to this point where you're like, man, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes I know exactly what I've got to do, but in this case, I would just be curious to know what he would do, because then that narrows down the field. You see what I'm saying? You know, so um, I don't know if you have to start out working underneath someone, because I think that if you want to go into private practice, the sooner you start generating a clientele base, the better. You know, that's why, like, if you want to have a private practice here in San Diego, great, because you've got people you're seeing as an intern there. 
But if you're going to be, in, you want to be there and get that clientele. But uh, you know, so if you're working underneath someone, it doesn't. You don't necessarily have that opportunity because generally, you're underneath them. You know. But if you can have someone that you pattern yourself afterwards, that would be very valuable, and I definitely recommend that. You know, because of all the different possibilities, at the end of it, a certain percentage of them are all going to work to different degrees, and so you just have to pick which one that you want to go with. And you can either take the lead completely on your own and you know, blaze your own path, or you can see what other successful herbalists are doing, understanding their treatment approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if someone comes in to me um, the first time, you know, that $95 is going to cover both their treatment, their intake, and then uh, not the cost of the herbs, but that it, the, the, yes, so yeah, they'll still go on for that. Mm. Yes, yeah, now you asked that question earlier. There's this thing about, oh, I'm taking prescription medications, can I take herbs? That's the one that's always going to come up. Um, can I give herbs during pregnancy? Duh. Yes. Probably should be. Just the right herbs. It, it just, of course. Right. Exactly. You want to know what you're doing. Why did, why was I always been comfortable giving them to pregnant women? Because I trained here, you know, to do that, basically. Uh, and, but, so, I almost never worry about prescription medications that people are taking. Honestly, the, 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 the fear, uh, Dongwe for breast cancer, of course, it's fine, you know. Um, Jurgan Sal causing high blood pressure, I've never seen that, you know, and the evidence to support it is minimal, you know. It certainly doesn't overact the history of Chinese medicine. So don't pay attention to that stuff. Greg Sperber is not going to like the sound of this, but. Um, when you get down to specific issues. Yes, you have to know what you, you have to know what you're doing, but do not limit yourself because some rat study ten years ago said that there might be a problem here. You know, um, I'm a very conservative practitioner. If any, if I don't have a scientific and a historical basis for my treatment strategy, I'm not going to recommend it. Uh, I mean, even like smoothies. Can I have smoothies? I don't know. <laughs> Ask me in a thousand years because then we'll see, you know, what the effect of that will be. So, um, blood thinners, be careful. Um, don't give like Shentong, Ju Yu Tong, you know, or something like that if they're on a huge dose of warfarin, you know, or Cumidin, something like that. Can you still give them herbs? Yes, you can. You know, but you just really want to know what the risks are, what the studies are, what the historical context has been, and then move forward slowly and cautiously. If uh, uh, I'm frequently reminded of the case working with Bob DeMone as an intern, and and uh, some lady comes in on a bucket load. I mean, I've seen just dramatically long lists of medications on diabetes, on every, uh, probably 25 medications long. No joke. And we started her in Shan Yao, <laughs> and then Swan Zhao Ren, and then Baiju. Every two weeks, we added in another herb, you know. So you can take it super slow like that, um, or a, a, another shade, you know, basically. But um, so, so yes. And then, you know, as far as like side effects. I haven't, I've really never come across the side effect of, of any notable concern, you know, with taking herbs. Um, you might give a loose stool once in a, in a blue moon, but geez, that's very far uh, in between. Um, if you have a formula that's too hot, you'll exacerbate your indeficiency, you know, no doubt, something like that. But uh, so a lot of these fears of prescribing herbs uh, due to sensitive cases or medications, yes, you should be concerned and you should be uh, the professional and you will know better than a lot of the doctors do, you know, as to the scope uh, uh, of your of your herbal medicine. You should definitely be the authority, uh, but don't limit yourself and don't be afraid. But you only won't have that fear if you have. I mean, don't be overconfident. You know, uh, you you want to be conservative and go with what you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
What about patients? Have you ever had um, run into it where you misdiagnose them, not because you're a bad practitioner, but just because it happens? Mm -hmm. You know, and which will happen. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's kind of medicine's not an exact science, so. Um, like, what happens if you misdiagnose the patient and they have a bad reaction? Like, how do you handle patients like that? Um, two things are going to happen that are both going to be uncomfortable, um, and this is really where you have to be secure and confident as a, as a practitioner. Someone's going to come back and say, my herbs did blah, 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 and you're like, wow, okay, so that random weird, you know, feeling that you had on, on your toe, you know, like, no, it wasn't caused by my herbs, you know, but uh, because, and then you're going to get the other cases to where it didn't work. And uh, just the other day, skin cases drive me crazy. I don't even want to take them anymore, but I will. They're hard. Skin, man. Have you found that too? I hate doing skin cases. And I was, I swear to you, I, ha I knew it. I knew exactly what it was. Wind, wind damp heat lodged in the skin, you know, with underlying spleen sheet efficiency. There's four or five different types of, you know, uh, uh, Feng San. And I gave her the one I thought I knew what it was. Didn't work. God. And then there's other times where I'm like, I think I know what's going on. Da, 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 da. And they come back, OMG. First night was amazing, you know. And, and so both of those are, go are going to happen. But if someone comes back and sit, and this is the most difficult one, you know, not getting results is just a hurt to your ego, but it's a learning experience. These ones to where you get, uh, your herbs made me, you know, get really weird dreaming about my ex and, you know, like that. And it's like... That's, uh, that's quite your job. Yeah, exactly. It tells you something clinically about what's going on, but you're, that's where you're just going to have to say, no, that wasn't caused by the herbs. Now, be, be diplomatic, of course, right? But don't go, oh, well, maybe, so let's not do herbs anymore. No, 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 no. You know, you take authority, and this is where you know your medicine is. You say, no, that's, that, that wasn't the issue here. Or you just kind of laugh it off. You know, this is where your, 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 your interpersonal skills, your people skills, really come into play. Yeah. yeah. Um, any particular recommendations about how you handle those cases or just kind of play it by per patient? Or? I usually will go like, well, no, that's... What's that? Do you ever get refunds? Never. No. Mm -mm. No, Th because there's no guarantee. It's, you know, we're not selling cars here sort of thing. This is medicine, and uh, we do the best that we can. And uh, medicine is the, the highest of the art forms, in my opinion, you know, uh, highly philosophical, and, but with tangible results. Either the patient gets better or they don't. You can't just play around building castles in the sky, you know, like Hegel would say, you actually have to deliver results, you know, sort of thing. And so you do the best that you can, but um, I would say probably, even with my prescription service, three, four times over the years, people are like, can I get a refund? No. Go ahead. Have you seen any difference with uh, encapsulated granules? Very good question. I don't like to do capsules whenever possible. Uh, why? Yeah, why, why is that? Well, because you're, have you ever worked with granules? They're sticky glue-like substances, you know. And I want them dissolved in liquid is always the most bioavailable form of anything you're going to give. Uh, advantage of liquid extracts and tinctures uh, and of dissolved granule herbs. Now, at the end of the day, it's better for someone to take their herbs than not take their herbs. So if you're dealing with someone who, let's say I get a new patient, right, and they come back, I didn't take my herbs because they taste like, who, you know, or, you know that's often is what they're going to say. Uh, I say, well, remember, I remember something that Eric told me. He's like, what are they, a six-year-old child? <laughs> right? Yeah. And you do take, you don't, you don't become a condescending jerk or, or, or substitute parental figure, but you make it very clear, like, we're adults here, and if you want to get better, you're going to take your herbs, you know. And... Um, if they come back again and say the same, I'll say the same thing. If they come back on the third time and they're still coming back to me by that time, then I'll consider, I'll put them into capsules because it's better to take some herbs than none. And, um, but I would use that as a tool in your, in your toolbox that you use only when necessary. Don't make it a primary option ever. 
don't even mention it when saying, I want to give you herbs. Don't be like, well, if you don't, we could put it into capsules because you might not like it. No. Then they're going to say that five out of you know, ten times. They're going to, yeah, give me the capsules because I don't want to take something that takes gross. I have lots of patients who, by the way, too, like the taste of their herbs. But with granules, I mean, you can mix an ounce of boiling water into a three, four scoop dose. It's like taking a shot. You don't even really taste it. And so that's another one of these little things is you learn little tricks of the trade on how to get to increase compliance. Yeah. Thing two yeah. to where it's, um, I've had people, they call me up, hey, can I get some ah huang from you? Oh, yeah. I'm like, no, I, I don't sell directly to the public any type of Chinese herb because they're, they're not food. We're under the food thing, the legislation, thankfully, you know. Um, but uh, I can get Xixin and, you know, Ma Huang uh, and use them. I mean, I use Xixin with, with a lot of this nasal stuff that's been going on these last couple of months. It's valuable, you know, for that. Uh, but there again, too, it's kind of like uh, my chef friend is fond of saying, everything's easy if you know how to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and so same thing with these herbs here. There's, it's easy to use these, these potentially dangerous herbs when that's why we're trained to the level that we're trained at and why we're the, the authority, you know. Yeah, and that's another good point, too, about raw herbs is I don't trust my patients to do it. And, and, and because this is the thing, I'm very conservative, so I want to know exactly what, I want to count for everything that I'm doing. I don't even like them taking vitamins that I don't give them, you know. Uh, and with raw herbs, there's, there's such a variability after it leaves my office, I don't like it. Because if it's not working, I'm going to think, well, did you make it right? That's always going to be the first thing I'm going to think. Whereas it's hard to mess up taking granules. Like you either used the right number of scoops or you didn't.